MGTV, η ομογένεια κοντά σα. Society. I am so proud that he honored us with his presence and he is this year's distinguished Helene. Congratulations to Dr. Diamandis. We look forward to all of your success. So tonight is the Scholarship Symposium 2018 for the Hellenic Medical Society. I, myself, have never, ever been more excited to hear anyone speak. And you too will know what I'm talking about after he's done. I hope you stay to watch the whole presentation. Peter Diamandis, Dr. Peter Diamandis, entrepreneur, engineer, physician, is absolutely the role model that makes us proud to be Greek, proud to be a human being, proud to be a product of scholarly work and imagination. I think you will absolutely be amazed with the talk that you are about to hear. I'm Peter Stadiopoulos. I'm the uh, chairman of scholarship for Hellenic Medical Society. Great, uh, another year to be able to provide scholarships to our Hellenic medical students uh, and students of uh, Greek descent. Uh, we have an incredible evenings. We have more new students. We have high school students. We see the, the future of medicine for the Greek descent people going extremely well. We have Dr. Diamandis from XPRIZE Foundation, an inspirational speaker and somebody that we aspire to be just like one day. And we hope that uh, tonight will be, like every other year, a success and we uh, look to the future, to our future students and all the great things that they could do and how they're going to make us proud one day. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to our 82nd Hellenic Scholarship event. Uh, we are very honored this evening to have Dr. Peter Diamandis, um, founder and president of the X, X Prize Foundation and Singularity University, come and be our speaker this evening. And we will also be giving scholarship award to our medical students college students, research scientists, and high school students. Uh, congratulations to all of them. We're very delighted to be here tonight. As we said before, this is what we all do, what we do. And the reason that we, we do these is for these people here, because we know that one day they're going to become the future. They're going to leave the Hellenic names out there. They're going to become wonderful physicians and make us all proud. But then they can also take over the reins and do it themselves as well. And that's really what we look forward to. So every year we have a scholarship symposium and we also honor students, students of distinction, students of Hellenic descent that plan on going into medicine and have an interest in the sciences. This year as in the past we have a lineup of some very credentialed, bright, innovative and nice students. These are the kind of people that we look forward to as future leaders of the Hellenic Medical Society and we are touched and honored that we can identify them and hope that our scholarships will assist them in their journey. This evening, we're very honored to have Dr. Peter Yamadis, founder and chairman of the X-Prize Foundation, founder and director of Singularity University. The X-Prize Foundation leads the world in designing large-scale incentive competitions. Singularity University is a global innovation community that uses exponential technologies to tackle the world's biggest challenges and to build a better future for all. Peter's favorite saying is, the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. As an entrepreneur, Peter has started over 20 companies in the areas of longevity, space, venture capital, and education. He has co-founded Bold Capital Partners, a venture fund with $250 million investing in exponential technologies. In addition to having earned degrees in molecular genetics, aerospace engineering from MIT, and a medical degree from Harvard, he is a New York Times best-selling author with two books, Abundance and Mold. Fortune magazine recently named Peter Diamandis as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. Peter, it has taken approximately two years to get you here. But we are all delighted that you have to speak with us, you can speak with us here this evening. 
I distinctly remember where I was standing when I got the email from you that you would be honored and you would accept our award as the Distinguished Hellenian this year. I know that the Hellenic Medical Society holds a special place in your heart and in the hearts of those in your family. We are all so very proud of you, your accomplishments, and your endeavors. And without further ado, I present to you all Dr. Peter Gomez. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. And uh, I grew up coming to this event, uh, to tomorrow's event. My sister and her husband met at this event. How many years ago? 32-ish years ago? Amazing. So a lot to say, um, but let me jump in. Uh, my, my goal here is to give you a sense of how amazing the world is, uh, how incredible the future is we have. The speed of technology is accelerating, it's not standing still, and the speed of the acceleration is itself is accelerating. We've talked about that in the Q&A. Uh, I've broken up this talk into four parts. Uh, three of them should make you feel amazingly great about the future. Three of them will either make you feel, and one of them will make you either feel very excited or very fearful, and I hope to flip fear into excitement. And I think we're fearful about things we don't understand. But if you start to get a sense of what it is and where it's going and how you can anticipate it, I hope that ultimately uh, you will turn that fear into just sheer excitement of not being able to wait for what's next. So I had a chance to write this book called Abundance, the Future is Better Than You Think. Uh, it was a top New York Times list about I don't know, seven years ago now, and I was the closing speaker at uh, the Clinton Global Initiative about you know, not far from here. It was President Clinton's favorite book of the year, and at the end of introducing me, he says, Peter, why are you so damn positive about the future? Don't you watch the news? And I said, President Clinton, I'm positive about the future for two reasons. One, no, I don't watch the news. We can talk about that. But secondly, I look at the data. So let's talk about the first. And here's a challenge. We are living in a world in which the news media is a drug pusher. And negative news is their drug. And every device that we have, our radios, our televisions, our newspapers, our iPads, we're seeing every negative story on the planet delivered to you in microseconds over and over and over again. Ten times more attention to negative news than positive news. Because as we were evolving on the savannas of Africa hundreds of thousands and millions of years ago, pissed a, you know, you missed a piece of good news, like some food over there, it's too bad. You missed a piece of bad news, your genes were out of the gene pool. And so we evolved the ancient piece of our, uh, of our temporal lobe called the amygdala that scans everything you see and everything you hear for negative news. And when you see it, you go on red alert, right? It's, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, is the old saying. And it's not that it's not true. It's just not a balanced view of all of the amazing things going on around the world all the time. You guys with me so far? And so if you actually look at the data, which I want to share with you, uh, it's amazing. Over the last 100 years, the per capita income for every nation on the planet has more than tripled. The Lifespan of the human race is more than doubled. We're going to work on doubling it again in the next couple of decades. The cost of food has dropped 20-fold. Cost of energy is 50-fold down. Transportation, hundreds of fold. Communication is millions of fold cheaper. Look at the data. This is people living in extreme poverty around the world, from 95% to just over 12% over the last 200 years. Why is it plummeting so fast? What's going on? This is people with literacy skills exploding on the planet. Here we see increase in average years of schooling. Why is the entire planet taking more time to learn? What's going on there? Child mortality rate has plummeted. It used to be a coin flip of whether your child lived to age five or not. Now it's 4%, still too high. Why did this go down? Maternal mortality rates have plummeted. It used to be dangerous to have a child. 
This is average life expectancy for all of human history. You know, it was late 20s to mid 30s. 100 years ago, it was, you know, roughly 40 years old. We doubled it. People are worried about, you know, overpopulation of planet Earth. I would say don't be. Be worried about underpopulation of planet Earth. You know, this is what's going on in the United States. We're now below the replacement birth rate levels in the US. Uh, Bill Gates has two great TED Talks in which he shows us that actually we're going to probably peak at 9.5 or 10 billion and very rapidly plummet. You do two things to a population and you make that population reduce, reduce its growth rate pressures. You may know what they are. Just go away. <laughs> Throw them out. Education is one. What's the other one? Come on, it's a group of doctors. No? Healthcare. Healthcare. Healthcare and educate, you do that, and come in countries, nations, cities going to negative decline. We could talk about that if you want. In the 1950s, a hundred countries had six or more children per family, and look how rapidly it's plummeting over time. This is hours worked per week in the developed world. We're actually working half as many hours. I know you don't, but the rest of the world does. Uh, to maintain our standards of living. Why? Why is that going on? Well, the fact that France has the least hours work. This is airline safety in the orange line over there. Right? It is the safest mode of transportation on the planet unless you're watching CNN, the Crisis News Network, watching the crash over and over and over again. I get a call from my mom saying, Peter, stop flying so much. Mom, it's the safest mode of transportation. <laughs> Look at the data. At Blue Line, is automotive fatalities, 1.3 million around the world, still too high. We'll talk about autonomous cars. Global death rates and natural catastrophes are you know, plummeting in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Why? Satellites on orbit, better computer models, ability to get help. This is from Steven Pinker's book, Better Angels of Our Nature, in which he shows us we're actually living during the most peaceful time ever in human history. And I don't think anybody would really know that, right? Because we're bombarded by every single murder on the planet over and over and over again. It is exhausting. Let me share with you a short video from a friend, Reed Zakaria. Uh, I make fun of the Crisis News Network or the constant negative news network, I don't call it, but let's take a look at this about, from uh, about 15 months ago. Let me try to present the broader trends to you in a series of graphs produced by Harvard Stephen Pinker and Andrew Mack, published in Slate. If you are terrified by the massive rise in terrorism you hear about, here is the chart detailing mass killings and genocides, which includes all Islamic terror. Since 1945, as you can see, it is a stunning decline with a small uptick, which is almost entirely in countries like Syria, Iraq, and Nigeria. We have data on civilians killed since 1988, and here's what that chart looks like. Here are some other charts worth looking at on the decline in homicides in America and the world, on the victimization of children, a huge drop, on the decline in rape in America, and one more chart, this time from Pew. The net migration from Mexico to America since the Great Recession has been zero. Yes, zero. So the question ultimately is why are these trends the last 200 years going on? Why have they been continuing? What's going on? And I would say that it's not because we've gotten smarter. It's not better politics. It's in my mind, and in the work that I do with my, my university and my XPRIZE, it's the impact of exponential technologies. It's technologies taking what used to be scarce and making them abundant. Let's talk about this is part two. It's the notion that there is nothing truly scarce. That technology is the force that takes whatever was scarce and makes it abundant over and over again. So let's take a look. I open, uh, opening story of my, my book, Abundance, is taking place in the year 1861. Napoleon III is inviting over to dinner the King of Siam and the Palace of Versailles. And to demonstrate how wealthy he is, 
Napoleon feeds all of the troops with silver utensils. Napoleon himself eats with gold utensils. But the king of Siam, the royal guest, is fed with aluminum utensils. And it turns out that this year, in the 1860s, aluminum was the most precious metal on the planet, more than gold and platinum, which is why the tip of the Washington Monument that was built in that same decade, the capstone is aluminum. Even though the Earth is 8.6% aluminum on the crust by weight, all the aluminum is bound with oxygen and silicates to make this thing called bauxite. And it was so energetically difficult to extract the aluminum from the bauxite, it was worth more than gold and platinum. And then in France, the United States, the same year, in fact, the same month, two scientists discovered how to use electrolysis to remove aluminum from bauxite. It went from being very rare, very expensive, to effectively free and available to everybody. Here's another example. Uh, a friend of mine in Silicon Valley has a company called the Diamond Foundry. And it has a, a machine about the size of a large refrigerator. In one end comes methane, water, and electricity. Out the other end comes perfect diamonds. And so what else do you think was scarce? What is, you know, the Beerus has taught us about the scarcity of diamonds and the value of diamonds. But I want you to imagine the notion that you know, these machines can make 6, 8, 10, 12 carat diamonds. How large, you know, large would you like it? You know, would you like imperfections or color? You can add that. Right? So again, what do we think of as truly scarce in our world? Um, energy, water, health care, learning? No. I'll talk about some of these. All of these, in my mind, are becoming more and more abundant, eventually at near zero cost. So let's talk about energy. Um, we used to go and kill whales to get oil to light the night so we could read. Then we ravaged mountainsides to get coal. Then we drilled kilometers under the seafloor. Right? Well, it turns out we have 8,000 times more energy hitting the surface of the Earth than we consume as a species in a year. Energy is not you know, scarce is massively abundant, maybe not in usual form yet. So last year, the price of coal was five to six cents per kilowatt hour. Right? In Mexico, it was, solar was 2.7. In Abu Dhabi, it was 2.4. In Argentina, it's 2.1. We're heading towards an all-electric economy. Right? We're going to get rid of, destroy, let go of, stop using petroleum, coal, all those hydrocarbons. Uh, it, was a, it was a member of the Saudi family who said that the Stone Age did not end for a lack of stones. Either will the Petroleum Age end for a lack of petroleum. This is a gigafactory in Reno that uh, Tesla has built. It's producing 35 gigawatt hours of battery capacity, more than the entire world put together. A hundred of these give us all of the battery storage we need for the planet for a full electric economy. Um, and it's literally been racing to the bottom. It's been extraordinary. Uh, there's on the order of $90 billion committed by all the automotive companies to electrify their fleets. We're going to an all electric car economy. Right? In fact, what we're seeing is government after government after government requiring no more sale of petroleum based cars. In Finland, it's in 2025. In Germany, it's in 2030. We're going to see our move away from gas. One of the areas I'm passionate about and think about is the abundance of vitality and longevity. So my mission is how do I make 100 years old and you 60? How do we add 20 or 30 healthy years in everyone's life this decade? Right. That's the mission. That's the objective. I've had the pleasure to, uh, to start two companies in this arena. I'm working on my third, and I'm an advisor, investor, friend of, of, of another one, another uh, half dozen or so. And what we're seeing is that the combination of AI, genome sequencing, CRISPR technology, cellular medicines, and such, and a massive influx of capital is really helping us understand why we die, why we age. I remember when I was in medical school, I was doing a, a joint medical degree and engineering degree, 
and I was watching a TV show about long-lived sea life, that certain species of uh, whales could live hundreds of years, sharks four, five hundred years, turtles six, seven hundred years, and the question was why can't they and why don't we? And for me, it was either a hardware problem or a software problem. And I think those are both solvable. I was just at the Vatican uh, bringing a group of my XPRIZE benefactors there, and we had, I hosted a debate with uh, cardinals, uh, rabbi, el elderman, um, sounds like a joke, and, and Francis Crick, the head of the NIH, and we're talking about the morality of immortality. Uh, or I flipped it and said, how about uh, the immort immorality of mortality? Right? And, and it's interesting. You know, the human being was never designed to live past age 30, to be very clear. Right? There's a few people under the age of 30, most of us not. You would enter puberty at age 13, at which point you would have a baby. And then by the time you were 26, your baby was having a baby. I'm not looking at my nieces that way. <laughs> and, and then before food was abundant, you know, before Whole Foods and McDonald's was around, the worst thing you could do was take food out of your grandchildren's mouth. So the best thing you could do for the selfish gene theory was die in your bits back to the environment. And then we started realizing that, you know, people over the age of 30 actually knew something. And so there's a whole slew of uh, capabilities. We'll talk about this. Young blood experiments, uh, proteins like GDF11, uh, uh, stem cells, stem cell replenishment, uh, cytolytic medicines, uh, wind pathway manipulations, all of these things which have the potential to truly make 100 years old and be 60. And the objective is how do we have the aesthetics, the mobility, and the cognition at 100 that we had at 60? That's the mission, that's the goal. And how do we do that sooner than later? Uh, Ray Kurzweil, my, my business partner and a dear friend, co-founder of Sula University, and a guy named Aubrey Gray, have a concept they call longevity escape velocity. And it's a notion that there is a moment in time when for every year that you live, science is extending your life for more than a year. And that concept is longevity escape velocity. When I ask Ray, when do you think that is? His answer is, you know, in the next 12 years or so. So call it optimistic, but, you know, my answer is don't die for something stupid in the interim. Wear your seatbelt, wear your, wear your ski helmet. So this is one of the companies who had a chance to start Cellularity. It's based on Bob Brewery's work. And what Bob has found in his science is that as we age, the stem cells in all the departments of our body rapidly diminish. Right? So when we're born, stem cells are there throughout every department of your body to differentiate and replenish everything. It's like the repairman of, of an amazing mansion. You have hundreds of repairmen. Your mansion is, is stayed in perfect shape. But imagine if they're dying off. And as, even as they're dying off, your repairmen start going senile. Uh, and they can no longer repair it, your building falls apart. And it's the same thing with our bodies. And so here's the data showing that the, you know, the diminution of stem cell quantity and quality as we age. And so the work that we're doing at Cellularity right now is it's the, we're the largest bankers of placental derived stem cells. And so we bank about 90,000 people's placentas. I have my two boys back there. It's not just cord blood, it's cord blood. Cells. The placenta is a 3D printer that manufactures the baby, and that the stem, the placenta is rich both in, in stem cells and in immunological cells that Cellularity is, uh, is working on. In phase one and phase two clinical trials of placental derived natural killer cells and T cells and CAR T cells, and then these uh, placental cells delivered intravenously to rejuvenate the body. Uh, and the work is pretty extraordinary. Um, in animal models, we're seeing a 30 to 40% life extension. We're seeing reversal of sarcopenia, reversal of uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, you may, some of the people in the audience may know this, if you have a woman who's got an autoimmune rheumatoid arthritis or lupus and she becomes pregnant, a lot of times 
that autoimmune disease goes away, right? And it is thought to be a function of the placenta actually keeping the host healthy, right? You want to take the, that fetus to term. So what we're doing at cellularity is really uh, turning the placental derived uh, stem cells into medicines uh, for basically rejuvenating the regenerative engine of the body, so to speak. Of course, you guys also know we're undergoing a genetic revolution. Craig Venter sequenced the first human genome in 2001 for $100 million and nine months' time. Today, it's on the order of 500 bucks. Illumina and the Beijing Genome Institute predict 100 bucks and one hour of time next year. And besides being able to sequence the human genome, the ability to edit it is extraordinary. Uh, CRISPR 2.0 coming out of MIT and Harvard, the notion that you go in and accurately just change a single nucleotide out of your 3.2 billion. And people say, well, what good is one letter going to be? Well, one letter causes 32,000 of 50,000 diseases are due to single point uh, mutations. So it's pretty extraordinary. Um, the other company that, uh, that I co founded I think is the future of medicine. Today, medicine is very much sick care. It's very much when you get sick, you go and you see somebody. But honestly, none of us know what the hell is going on inside our body anytime. We don't. I'm a pilot. I fly two airplanes. Before I take off, I make sure everything is perfect. Right? Modern day cars have sensors, hundreds of processors in them, measuring everything. Our bodies, our refrigerators are better wired than our bodies are. So what we built in San Diego's facility where you come in for three hours, we sequence all 3.2 billion letters of your life. We sequence your microbiome. We look at 1,100 chemicals in your metabolome. We do a full body MRI head to toe in a 3T Siemens machine. We do an MRI of your brain, of your brain vasculature. We do a coronary CT, a lung CT. We generate 150 gigabytes of data. And we feed that into our machine learning protocols. And the goal is to find out two things. One, is there anything going on inside your body you should know about right now? And if there is, fix it right now. And people say, I don't want to know. Bullshit, of course you want to know. <laughs> you want to know, you want to fix it right now. The second thing you want to find out from your genome is what are you likely to come down with? And then start watching for that more frequently. Right? So this is a prospective, personalized, uh, form of medicine. Um, here's the results. Uh, you know, it's, we started this as a $25,000 per visit experience, and it, it was expensive. We lowered it down to $5,000 for the first visit and $3,000 for every subsequent visit. But here's the first 1,200 patients. 2% of people, two of you in the room here, could have personalized it, have a brain or aortic aneurysm you don't know about. 2% of a high grade uh, cancer or uh, tumor. Um, 3.4% have cardiac related and so forth, right? 14.4% of people come and have symptoms that they need to know about and take care about now. And another 40% have symptoms or have, uh, have phenotypic or genotypic uh, um, elements that they will impact them for the medical care of the rest of their life, right? So this is a flip of how, we're, how medicine should be. Eventually, this will be a continuous process. We're continuously being monitored all the time. But right now, this is where we're based in San Diego. We're opening a clinic this next week in Naples, Florida, then hopefully in Boca, and we'll be opening them around, around, uh, around the world, except in Europe, which has strange water. Um, if anybody's interested, by the way, it's just VIP at healthnucleus.com. You can send an email to my team. I just, when I lecture, I talk about it. It costs us a lot more than the 5,000 bucks we charge you. The price will eventually come down internally, but for us right now, it's the data. All right, let's talk about, um, about, this is part three. This is the part that gets me excited and scares a lot of people. It's like, what's going on in AI and robotics? Where are we right now? How is this gonna change the world? Well, let's take a quick look. So robots are coming and they're getting stronger and better and more popular and more capable. 
Back in around 2013 or so, there was the Fukushima nuclear reactor in Japan, and after the tsunami hit, and there was no way that we could actually get people in there to turn it off. So both in Japan and the United States, this is the Defense and Natural Project Research Agency, had a competition. Can we build robots that can climb stairs, open doors, drive cars, you know, go turn valves and so forth? This is the blooper reel I'm going to show you. This is the year 2015. The blooper reel, watch it, we'll see how fast things have moved along. So that's 2014. Let's fast forward, or 2015, fast forward a couple of years. This is Boston Dynamics robot called Atlas. Boston Dynamics run by a friend of mine, Mark Graber. He used to be owned by Google. Google sold them to, uh, to SoftBank in Japan. Why did a Japanese company buy this robot company? First of all, Japan doesn't have a replacement generation. An aging population don't have a workforce. And so the question is, can robots provide the labor? So this is 2017. So that isn't better motors or material sciences, it's neural networks, it's AI, it's the ability of the, of the sensory data and the motor data to be better integrated and for it to learn. Now let's take a look here, this is this year, 2018, the same robot, better <laughs> machine learning capability. Pretty amazing. This is another robot. This is Google's autonomous car. Uh, I've had the honor of having Larry Page on my board for the past uh, 13 years. And I knew him when he became very excited about autonomous cars. And there was another DARPA competition for cars that could drive themselves. And DARPA wanted this for military supply lines. So you could have troop carriers and and, and stuff going out and not have a supply line as a sitting duck for the drivers. He wanted it because he wanted to save lives and the notion that we have this, you know, the idea that you have a 16-year-old kid driving a 5,000-pound vehicle is going to sound insane in the future. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so there's Larry, Sergey, and Eric, and the question is, how fast will autonomous cars change our lives? And the answer is very fast. And there's a great analogy. And, and it's this. This was one of the streets in New York in 1904. And if you look very carefully here, uh, you'll see two cars. The cars in, in the early 1900s were very bespoke vehicles, very expensive, very rare, less than 10% penetration. And then if you fast forward from 1904 to 1917, the horse and buggy is gone. It's just vaporized, right? And, and how fast did this happen? Well, the Ford Model T came online in 1908. And then by 1912, the traffic count was more cars than horse and buggies. And if you read the articles back then, you know, it was pretty intense. It stank. Just, you know, just millions of gallons of horse pee and horse manure on the roads all the time. It was pollution of a very different type. So, we have every major car company now is focused on autonomous cars. This is Google's spin-out called Waymo. Uh, which is operational in 25 cities. They've just gotten permission to operate without a safety driver, and those drivers don't add any safety. 
and uh, in Arizona and California. And so the question is, how fast is this going to be your future? And the prediction is that within 10 years, you're not going to be driving a car, none of you. Why? I want you to imagine that an autonomous car it is five times cheaper than owning a car. Right? So that, that you know, you don't have to worry about insurance, parking, um, you know, whatever. We just moved houses and we turned one of our garages into a bedroom and the other two garages into storage. Right? Because just the cars are going to be going away. There's a future in which, you know, you are at breakfast, you get up from breakfast, you're walking towards the front door, your AI knows your schedule, knows where you're going. It has had two autonomous cars circling the blocks, and as you open the front door, a car pulls in. Um, I have an aura ring that I use. It has about 16 sensors measuring uh, pulse waveform, thermal, um, uh, a few other accelerations and so forth, it measures my sleep. And so my AI may well know how to get enough sleep last night, so it pulls up a car that's got a lie down flat bed in the back. It's a very considerate AI. Um, but ultimately, it's going to transform our lives because all of a sudden it gives you back an hour or two hours of your day. Traffic reduces massively. You don't have to have parking garages or parking lots or anything. It gives you back in, in, in LA, 15% of our real estate comes back into public use. This is a car being put forward by GM. It's coming out next year. It's got no steering wheel and no pedals. So prediction of car ownership dead by mid to late 2020s. The, at least we're going to see the requirement of a special license if you have to drive a car. But we're seeing in, uh, in the millennials, 15% don't own cars, they're Ubering. And in aging populations, it's just safer to Uber than to drive. All right, so that's a little about robots. And there's going to be, God knows, 1.6 million drones airborne by 2021 over the United States. Drones are robots, delivery drones, all kinds of things coming on. Let's talk about AI. So most of us, when we think about artificial intelligence, have this iconic memory. Of, um, of when Kasparov beat against Deep Blue in 1997. And what happened last year was extraordinary in that uh, if you think chess is a hard game, the game of Go is, is you know, quadrillions of times more op optionalities in terms of how many, uh, uh, how many tree branches it has. Well, Google built a program called AlphaGo, and AlphaGo won against the top champion of, of Go, Lee Sedol, 10 years before it was predicted. And it won four games to one. And what I want to show you is how quickly it progressed over the course of 18 months. My goal is to show how rapidly these things are changing. So you're going to hear a present in a short video from the guy who designed the AlphaGo program as part of Deep Blue, one of Google's companies. I'm sorry, as part of uh, DeepMind, one of Google's companies. AlphaGo Zero is the strongest Go program in the world. It outperformed all previous versions of AlphaGo. Specifically, it defeated the version of AlphaGo that won against the world champion Lisa Dahl, and it beat that version of AlphaGo by 100 games to zero. So all previous versions of AlphaGo started by training from human data. And they were told, well, in this position, the human expert played this particular move, and in this other position, the human expert played here. AlphaGo Zero doesn't use any human data whatsoever. Instead, what it has to do is learn for itself, completely from self-play. So the reason that playing against itself enables it to do so much better than using strong human data is that, first of all, AlphaGo always has an opponent of just the right level. So it starts off extremely naive. It starts off with completely random play. And yet, at every step of the learning process, it has an opponent, a sparring partner, if you like, that's exactly calibrated to its current level of performance. And to begin with, these players are very, very weak, but over time, they become progressively stronger and stronger and stronger. So what you're 
potential for an AI to learn on its own by playing itself. Right? And so we're going to see AI coming into the marketplace in a multitude of predictable ways, very much in medicine. Right? AI will become the diagnostician, AI will become the radiologist, AI will become the, you know, pick your favorite area. And medicine is going to change very rapidly. And it's how you change with it what a physician does versus what an AI does, right? What I talked about when, uh, in a previous presentation when my, when my father passed, um, you know, I remember there was a cardiologist, there was a, uh, there was a, a neurologist, there was an orthopedist, there was basically every specialty there looking, but who was there watching the whole person? Right, so the question becomes, how do you allow technology to do what it does well, so you as the physicians can be human and caring and have the time? Because right now you're crushed by paperwork, and you're crushed by the fears of lawsuit, and you're crushed by everything else. And it's very different as a medical field, um, the field of medicine than ever before. This is uh, another AI program that is uh, driving these robotic arms. So these arms are trying to learn how to pick up an object on their own. They're experimenting. So as they, as they try and grab something, um, if they succeed, it reinforces a neural pathway. If they fail, it de-reinforces whatever the right word should be. Um, and so what's fascinating is because all of these are linked together, if one robot arm learns something, they all learn it, right? As if, you know, it's as if uh, Alexia here learned algebra first and seventh grade, and as soon as she learned it, everybody else in class learned it, right? So in your autonomous car, if you're driving in unique conditions and your car sees gravel or ice in the dark, and it gets sensor data that learns it, teaches it how to navigate that situation, uh, teaches it how to, how, to, how to run that navigation better, it transmits that information to learn. So every other neural net learns that. Right? In the future, the majority of surgery, in my mind, with all due respect to the surgeons, I'm not sure when, but there's going to be a point in which, if you're the patient, what if you're, you guys know the answer, right? It's not a joke, it's actually a good question here. But uh, what's the one question you ask when you're interviewing your surgeon? How many deaths, how many lawsuits? No. How many, operations? how many operations did you do this morning? Right? Yeah. How many operations did you do today? Right? That's what we want to know. More frequency, right? Because every single, every single, yeah, you did a good job. Thank you. I'm still. <laughs> Um, so how many operations do this morning? And so at the end of the day, it's the frequency of which you do this, the number of conditions you see, the aberrations, the AV malformations, everything that you see. There will be a point at which an op or robot oper a robot operating system will see millions of these. Right? So you see the human walking towards you, going, oh, no, 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 I do not want the human touching me. I want the robot that's done it a million times. So there's going to be changes coming. And how do you work with that technology? AI is able to read faces. This is out of China. This is Face++ plus plus that can, in fact, um, recognize any of the 1.3 billion Chinese citizens in under three seconds. Uh, AIs can read facial recognition on emotion, uh, on, on fear, on excitement, on whatever it might be. Has everybody here seen Google Duplex? Can I just see a show of hands? Who has not seen the Google Duplex AI making a hair salon appointment? Who's not seen it? Okay, I'm gonna show it then. All right. So this is an AI. This is a Google Assistant that is expert in making a phone call to make an appointment of some type. And this is was shown about six months ago at Google's I.O. conference. And you're going to see this AI calling an unsuspecting hair salon. Take a listen. Hi, 
contact my off here. Hi, I'm calling you with a woman care cut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's your first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So the implications are pretty interesting. Uh, there was a lot of outcry about that, saying that, and now Google's duplex assistant identifies itself as a Google assistant before it calls. But we're going to start to see AIs facilitating our lives in a multitude of ways. Um, but when it becomes so human-like and so um, unsuspecting, right? People are calling for laws that are requiring the AI to identify itself as a computer. That's good for those who agree. Here's another AI. This is uh, out of New Zealand. This is called Ava. Uh, she is a virtual human, uh, an empathic virtual human. And this is an AI that's able, it's a, it's a visual AI, which is a video, uh, that can pick up your emotions if you're sad, if you're happy, if you're excited, if you're frustrated, and mirror those back to you as she interacts with you. Ava is the Autodesk Virtual Assistant. So she's a digital human and she's designed to basically guide you through problem solving steps. Hello, my name is Ava. How can I help you? So she will become your customer assistant at your front desk of your medical office, uh, remembering everybody all the time, making it simple. So I want to show you one that, you know, Obviously, I'm an optimist, but some things do worry me, and this is a technology called DeepFake. We're able to replicate people's voices perfectly. There's a couple of companies right now that from five, 10 second clips, 60 seconds of your voice, can replicate your voice to the point where it can fool a voice recognition system. Right? About a few minutes of voice data can fool your husband, wife, mother, brother, whatever it might be. But let's take a look at something called the video deep fake. Check this out. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. The heart of our method is a recurrent neural network that transforms input audio to a time-varied mouth shape. Now, most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. We get it through our job, or through Medicare or Medicaid. Then, we synthesize mouth texture. And what you should know is that, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. You know? Next, we enhance details in teeth. Now have free preventive care. There are no more annual or lifetime limits on essential health care. Finally, we blend the mouth texture onto a retime target video and match the pose. Women can get free checkups, and you can get charged more just for being a woman. Uh, here we go. Uh, President Barack Obama, uh, when you give a speech, uh, make sure you use uh, a lot of pauses and speak uh, at a very weird tempo. Uh, up and down, uh, down and up. Up, up, down, down. <laughs> the point there is both of those were, uh, were individuals obviously speaking, but the AI was, was forming the video. Uh, and being able to create a video of anybody, and, and you, need, you need a few hundred hours uh, to train the machine learning the neural nets how to create that video. And so the politicians and most famous people who've got a lot of video coverage will be easily spooked. Um, and so it's heading, one of the challenges, of course, is going towards a post-truth or a fake news future. And yeah, that does concern me. But just share with you a little bit where things are, are going. 
But if you thought things were moving fast, hold on because they're moving even faster than you think. So uh, Ray Kurzweil, who if you know him, is considered one of the smartest thinkers in the field of AI on the planet. He heads AI now for a large segment of Google. Um, uh, he's my co-founder of Singularity University. Uh, he has written a number of books. His prediction success rate is 86% for predictions that he makes of when something's going to happen, when when Kasparov is going to when when can be beat, when Go is going to be beat, the first autonomous cars, and all of those things. He hits them to the year. And one of his predictions is number one: we're going to have human level AI by 2029. Time check, that's 11 years from now. And that we're going to have brain-computer interface by 2035, meaning that we're going to be able to connect your neocortex to the cloud. Right? So if you want a billion times more memory, you got it. You want a million times more cognitive capacity? right? Because right now, your phone is basically doing some computation here, but the hard stuff goes over the over you know 4G to the cloud, gets processed, and the answer comes back. So the concept of the computer brain computer interface. So my friend Brian Johnson has committed hundred million dollars of his capital and his focus heads down on connecting the brain to the cloud, as has uh, Elon with Neuralink. My venture fund has investment in this woman, uh, Mary Lou Jepson, who um, was heading VR at Facebook, at Apple, at Google, uh, and she's using red laser light that can penetrate skin and skull and go down into the brain, and then the refraction, the reflection, the refraction of red, that red laser light and holography to be able to interrogate neuron by neuron level. It's amazing. Uh, we just were one of the lead investors in the last round. So I want to show you a short video with me and Ray Kurzweil from a year ago at my event called the Abundance 360. Uh, we're going to connect our neocortex to the cloud. Now you could say that this is already a connection. It's indirect. My brain directs my fingers, and the information goes into my brain through my eyes and ears. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we're going to make a direct connection from our brain wirelessly to expand that number of 300 million. Now this is interesting in that it's billions of times more powerful per dollar than the computer I used when I was a student. But I can actually, but that's not the most interesting thing about it. If I want to multiply it a thousand or a million fold, it connects seamlessly and wirelessly to the cloud. But suddenly I can use 10,000 computers to do some complex operation. We can't do that yet directly from our brain. There are people who have computers in their brains like Parkinson's patients. Those are expanding exponentially, but ultimately we'll I mean, that'll be the primary application of these now robots coming in the 2030s, is to directly connect our neocortex to synthetic modules in the cloud that uh, use the same algorithm. So, for example, at Google, uh, we're, we're implementing synthetic neocortex. Watson includes uh, similar algorithms. So, you know, I'm walking along and I say, oh, there's Peter Diamandis. I've got to think of something clever to say. I've got two seconds. My 300 million neocortical modules isn't going to cut it. I need 3 billion first in two seconds. <laughs> I'll be able to access that in the cloud. It will become a hybrid of biological and non-biological thinking. That's the primary application uh, I see of AI. So when we talk about the future, uh, we are and have always been converging and merging with technology. Right. Humans were never meant to be flying at 45,000 feet at 800 miles per hour, or driving, or living as long as we are. We have been using technology to extend our reach and capability, and we are in the process over the next 20 years of beginning to manipulate and merge it, merge with it. All right, I'm going to finish with uh, part four, which is a belief I have that there is no problem we cannot solve. Uh, that we have in our lifetimes the ability to uplift every man, woman, and child on this planet, period. Uh, I grew up passionate about space. I was born in the 60s. Love Apollo. It showed us what was possible. It's hard to believe this was 49 years ago. Insane. And this showed me where the human race 
was right now. And then this scientific documentary showed me where the human race was going. Thank you for your groans. And I you know, wanted to become an astronaut, um, much to the dismay of my parents. I'm a doctor. We'll talk more about that tomorrow night. Uh, and, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, I read about this guy, Charles Lindbergh, who in 1927 crossed from New York to Paris to win a $25,000 prize. Uh, a Frenchman, Raymond Arte, born under the Pyrenees Mountains, comes to America um, through you know, Ellis Island, becomes a hotel busboy, then a hotel manager, then a hotel owner of Hotel Lafayette. Uh, post World War I, became enamored with aviation and was basically wanting to connect his birthplace of France and his new home of New York, and he offered up a $25,000 prize. And that $25,000 prize inspired nine teams who spent $400,000 going after that $25,000 prize. And that's it. That's how I'm going to create my space dreams. I'm going to create a prize for private space flight that would take me and my friends up into space. And so, uh, I called it the X Prize because I didn't know where the money was going to come from. I didn't have money at the time. And at the end of the day, it was a $10 million prize for the first team who could build a spaceship carrying three adults up to space, land, and within two weeks make the trip again. Um, it works amazingly well. We had 26 teams around the world who spent $100 million going after the $10 million prize. They're all optimists. Uh, here was the winning vehicle, Spaceship One, in the Smithsonian, under, under the sunrise of Mojave on, its, on the winning day, October 4th, 2004. Here she is in the Smithsonian, right next to the Spirit of St. Louis, that inspired it in the first place. Uh, on the heels of that being won, uh, Richard Branson came in and committed you know, a quarter of a billion dollars to commercialize that vehicle and create Spaceship Two. I'm lucky I have a seat to fly on that vehicle. I'll fly hopefully in the next year or so. Yeah, if my mom goes, oh. <laughs> Don't worry, mom. I'll tell you after. <laughs> uh, we built an amazing board of trustees, uh, of benefactors who underwrite our X prizes. Uh, we've launched about $150 million of prizes, another $200 million in development. We're working on them across the board um, from uh, a really, a, we're getting ready to launch a $100 million cancer X Prize for very early detection and Alzheimer's X Prize. Uh, we had this one, which was a Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. It's worked for the Star Trek Tricorder world. We chose 15 diseases and we asked teams to build a handheld mobile device for the mother or father, not the doctor or nurse, at home at 2 o'clock in the morning when your kid is sick. Um, Award that last year. This is going on right now. Uh, this is a prize that Elon Musk has funded for $15 million, and then the DeVos family and our friend Tony Robbins. And we ask teams to build an Android app that can take a child in the middle of no place from illiteracy to literacy on their own in 15 months. So we had some 700 teams enter this competition, and we narrowed it down to five finalists. Uh, we got 2,500 tablets. Uh, we went into Tanzania, interviewed families, villages, found places where there was zero literacy, gave them the tablets, and we're going to, that competition is going to complete this March. And then the winning team wins the money, and then we open source the winning software, right? So it becomes a teacher on every phone, so you can manufacture a billion teachers per year. This is next prize going on. Uh, it's a carbon extraction prize. Can you pull the CO2 out of the smokestack and produce a product more valuable than the cost of extracting the CO2? So you turn this into a profit center for a natural gas or a coal plant. I just came back from, uh, uh, from Greece. How long was it? Two, 10 days ago? Two weeks ago. Uh, we have the finals of this prize going on. So we know more about the surface of the moon 
at the surface of Mars than we do the ocean floor. We've mapped less than 5% ocean floor because the physics of salt water makes it so difficult for radio frequency and light to penetrate. So we asked teams, build a robot device that you can launch from the shoreline, can go out, you know, 50 kilometers, whatever it is, and then go down 4,000 meters, 12,000 feet down, and map 250 square kilometers in under 24 hours autonomously, then come back and bring back the data. We're down to five finalists that are testing in Greece right now. Amazing, right? Uh, we met uh, Marcel and Katarina and I were there. We met two of the five teams. One team was out of Germany. It was a professor and a dozen students. They had raised $3 million. Another team was two people out of Switzerland funding it themselves for a couple million dollars. They identified, by the way, five Spanish galleon locations they wanted to go and map next for gold bullion. Uh, but at the end of the day, why is it a team of like, like a dozen college students, graduate students doing this, and it's not the largest corporations? No one asked. Right? Uh, this is a great one. We launched this one uh, just uh, in March. And this is the one that says, uh, it's the Avatar X Prize. All Nippon Airways funded this. And they said, what's going to obsolete the aluminum tube, the airplane, from going someplace? So this is one. I want you to imagine in the future, it's not me standing here. It's a robot that has an e-ink face. I'm home in Santa Monica, where I live. I'm wearing VR goggles and a haptic suit and gloves. And as I walk around, the robot walks around, right? As I reach out and shake your hand, the robot reaches out and shakes your hand. And you feel like I'm here and I don't feel like I'm here, right? So this is going to be a future of sort of the house call or the future of, uh, of uh, emergency, you know, uh, relief teams, whatever it might be. So some 400 teams have entered this competition. The, the X Prize in my last slide that we just awarded uh, is the Water Abundance X Prize. And people talk about water wars and water scarcity, right? We live on a planet that is a water planet, 70% covered with water, 97.5% salt water, 2% the ice caps. We fight over half a percent of fresh water. But it turns out there's a massive amount of water in the atmosphere, quadrillions of liters, or in the biomass. So we asked teams, build a device that can extract 2,000 liters of water out of the air for under two cents per liter in 24 hours. And we just awarded that prize uh, about a month ago. I think that's the, the bottom line. Rather than being fearful of this, how do we, how do we, this is coming. Uh, it's not stoppable. Um, uh, how do we use it to make the world a better place? Uh, I think AI is the greatest tool humanity has ever created to help us solve our biggest problems. Um, and so I, I have a faith that, that you know, what I teach at Singularity University is if you want to become a billionaire, help a million people. Right? Uh, the world's biggest problems, the world's biggest business opportunities. And so in a world of increasing entrepreneurship where more and more people around the world are empowered like never before, they have the ability to go and solve more and more problems and it makes the world a better place. Yes, there are going to be challenges. We can all focus on that. We all do already. But like I said, you know, negative mindset is never giving you a positive life. So I hope that you will walk away here uh, tonight, perhaps uh, a little more knowledgeable about where things are. Uh, I spend my life every minute of the day reading, writing, interviewing, investing uh, in these technologies. Uh, and I am looking for the good. Uh, I'll close on this, that a negative mindset will never give you a positive life. And uh, if you like these slides, if you just send an email to that address, you'll get slides downloaded. I put out a tech blog every Sunday, which I have to finish writing tomorrow. Um, and so you'll get access to that as well as you want. So, an honor and pleasure to be here. And uh, I'd be happy to take your questions on anything other than sports or politics. Uh, yeah. Thank you. What can you say? You know, I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna.
end it on that. I know there were a few questions you can ask uh, Peter or Dr. Diamandis uh, directly, but what can we say? Thank you, everyone. Congratulations to the scholarship recipients, and we hope to see you tomorrow at the gala. Peter Diamandis, Dr. Peter Diamandis, entrepreneur, engineer, physician, is absolutely the role model that makes us proud to be Greek, proud to be a human being, proud to be a product of scholarly work and imagination. I am so proud that he honored us with his presence and he is this year's distinguished Helene. Congratulations to Dr. Diamandis. We look forward to all of your success. MGTV USA. Οι δραστηριότητες της ελληνοαμερικανικής κοινότητας με βίντεο και πλήρες ρεπορτάζ. Επισκεφτείτε την ιστοσελίδα μας, mgtvusa.com. Καλύπτουμε καθημερινά τα γεγονότα στην Ομογένεια.